Hey Crash, today we're going to finish off our discussion on colour. More specifically, we're going to talk about how the eye interprets light and issues we can have with our sight. My beauty is blinding. And my contract is binding, which is why I'm forced to do this show with you. The human eye has a relatively simple structure considering its essential and complex function. Light enters the eye by passing through the cornea, a refractive clear window which directs light towards the interior of the eye. Light then passes through the pupil, a hole in the centre of the iris. The iris is the coloured part of your eye, and works like a camera shutter, shrinking or expanding to control the amount of light which enters the eye. It's like the eye's personal sphincter. I mean, I, I guess? It's kind of a gross way of thinking about it. There's a kind of cool trick you can do to see how the iris works. Next time you're with someone, get them to close and cover their eyes. Try to get rid of as much light as possible. Then stare at their eyes and get them to open them and stare straight back at you. You should be able to see their iris shrink as it goes from the environment with not much light to a sudden flood of light. As an added bonus, periods of extended eye contact are known to increase affection between people. So if you do this trick with your crush, then you can double down on the benefits. Or while their eyes are closed, you can put on a clown mask. The reaction is hilarious! Just so you know, I still haven't forgiven you for that. Light finally passes through our eye's natural lens. The lens also acts just like the lens in a camera, altering its width to focus light correctly. Light then transmits through the bulk of the eye, the vitreous humour, towards the retina at the back. Crash also has a vitreous humour because it's fragile and transparent just like glass. Ouch! Your humour is like broken glass. Sharp and painful. Jeez, I kinda feel bad. Sorry, Crash. It's alright. Now, back to my thoughts on ocular sphincters. What if you could defecate out of your eyeballs? Or, or what if you could see out of your anus? <gasps> is that why they call it a brown eye? And I'm back to hating you. The retina is essentially the innermost layer of cells in the eye, and it's fed with nutrients by the choroid layer surrounding it. The sclera is the outermost layer, and this is what gives our eyes their whitish appearance. But the retina is the real star of the show because it contains the photosensitive cells which enable us to see. Oh god, they're sensitive? Why does everything have to be so sensitive these days? Why can't I just call people racial slurs whenever I want without being pulled up by the PC police? Or even worse, an SJW. These cells are photosensitive, meaning that upon interacting with light they undergo a reaction resulting in an electrical impulse. This electrical impulse is relayed by the optic nerve into the brain, where it interprets and generates the image which we see. This is an incredibly complex process, and we won't delve into it too much here, but there are two main cool functions of image processing by our brain. The first is that we obviously all have two eyes, which means that our brains have to integrate both images into one consistent, congruent image. Well, not everyone has two eyes. What about pirates? You're so privileged! Okay, well most of us do. The corpus callosum in the brain is responsible for this task, and it gives us the incredibly important ability to sense depth. Because our eyes have slightly different angles on the world in front of us, we get slightly different images. But by combining these angles together, we get an appreciation for the 3D aspect of our world. So, people with one eye just see the world as a 2D image? Huh. Not a huge deal, I guess. I mean, I only look at my computer and TV all day anyway. Well, the thing is that even with only one eye, people don't lose all of their depth perception. That is to say that distances more than 20 feet away appear the same, whether you have one eye or two, since the images in both eyes at that distance appear the same. A neat trick is to cover one eye and try to judge distance. When you find it difficult, try shaking your head from side to side. Your mind will learn to use the varying images as your head rotates back and forth to construct a 3D impression of the environment around you, giving you back your depth perception. Don't do this in public though, because people just think you're weird. Good advice. Another amazing function your brain performs is to flip the image that your eyes see. Because the retina is a concave surface, it bends the light and takes an upside down image, just like we learnt in the previous part of this episode. As a countermeasure, in the early days of our infancy, our brains learn to invert the image, thus putting it the right way up and making perception easier. BULLSHIT! You're telling me that as babies we see everything upside down? No wonder we crawl everywhere, that would be trippy as fuck! It's true, and we can even reverse the process. Professor Theodore Erasman experimented on his assistant and student Ivo Kohler by giving him special glasses to wear. The glasses were designed to invert the image entering Kohler's eyes. Of course, at first, Kohler stumbled it around, unable to see properly. But his brain eventually adjusted to this new perception and flipped the image again. 
Upon removing the glasses, his brain was able to perform the same readjustment after a few days to return his vision to normal. Our brain and its image processing power is vital to our ability to see. I'm gonna stand on my head for five days and see if I can get the same thing to happen. Well, that's probably not a great idea because the blood would rush to your head and, uh... You know what? Actually, yeah. Give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? Starting... Now! Now back onto those photosensitive cells I was talking about before. There's actually two types. Rods and cones. People usually hear that rods are for monochromatic vision and cones are for colour vision, but this isn't really the full story. Rods exist in a far greater number than cones and occupy almost the entire surface of the redna except for the very centre. They're also more than a thousand times more sensitive to light than cones, capable of being triggered by just a single photon under the optimal conditions. Oh yeah, just a single photon touch, baby. Real delicate. I know that's how you like it. Oh god, the blood is already starting to take its effect. Rods are particularly useful for night vision. Well, technically it's dark adapted vision, but night vision sounds way cooler. You may have noticed that if you're in a bright room and then shut the lights off, it takes a good 10 minutes at least for your eyes to adapt to the decrease in light. That's because rods adapt much more slowly to changes in light than cones. In addition, rods are keen at detecting changes in movement. Combine this with their peripheral localization on the retina, and you can see how our ancestors used this motion sensing ability to detect fast moving predators in their peripheral vision. Whereas rods have no ability to help people see Monday predators with their white bands and candy and such. You also may have noticed that while looking at the stars, you can see a star in your peripheral vision, but when you look directly at it, it seems to disappear. Since rods are more sensitive to light than cones, and localized in your peripheral vision, this means that your peripheral vision is able to detect dimmer sources of light than your main area of focus. What does it mean if your head hurts and everything is going dimmer? And your head is throbbing? It means you're an idiot, Crash. Get back on your feet. Culture, I may be stubborn. You may be stubborn, but what? No, that was the end of my sentence. I'm just stubborn. Right. Anyway, now onto the star of today's show. Cones. Cones are what enable us to perceive colour. Despite being outnumbered by rods at 120 million rods to just 6 million cones, they dominate the centre of our retina in a densely packed region of cells known as the macula. In the centre of the macula is the fovea centralis, a 0.3 mm diameter area which exclusively contains cones. This region, the centre of our vision, has the best colour detection and highest visual acuity. I wish I could say that that's the end of the story, but it's not. Ugh, this is so mind-numbing to listen to! I mean, that could just be because you're still doing a handstand. Then how do you explain me finding all the other episodes so boring? Checkmate, bitch! We have three types of cones. Red, green, and blue. That's why screen displays use the RGB color system to display images on a screen. Our eyes and brain combine these colors to create the full spectrum of colors. Red cones are the most abundant, about 64% of all cones, with green cones being half as present, only 32%, and blue cones making up a measly 2-4% of all cones. However, blue cones are unique in that they're not found in the fovea centralis, instead being located in the periphery along with the rods. In addition, they're much more sensitive than red or green cones. Despite being outnumbered, we're still able to see blue colours fairly well, suggesting that there's some kind of blue amplifying step in our visual relay pathway. All I see is blue culture. The deep blue of sadness from having to do this with you. And then it's certainly followed by a vicious red that engulfs me in anger! <sighs> I really wish you'd just stand up already. The perception gets far more complicated when it comes to combining all of the visual information we receive. As explained in the previous part of this episode, colours are associated with different wavelengths of light. But when multiple different wavelengths are hitting our eyes at once, we get a combined effect which sums to give us a unique colour. The CIE chromaticity diagram is a chart showing what combinations of wavelengths of light give us different colours. It's pretty complex, but all you really need to know is that this chart is like shorthand for colour determination. If we combine all of the colours, we perceive white light, and intersections of certain colours give us yellow, magenta, and cyan. Cyan is a bluey-green colour, which I only ever hear people use in the context of printer ink cartridges. It might be the sound of gushing blood in my head, but didn't you just answer the question? Everyone sees the same colours according to this diagram. Well, you see, not quite. This diagram lays out a spectrum of colours, a pattern if you will. 
But what if our brain processes this incoming information differently, and spits out a different colour? For example, my red could be your orange, my orange could be your yellow, etc, all the way until we get back to the start, where my purple is your red. The spectrum could be rotated in any number of combinations to give us different colour perceptions. I mean, we've already seen how important the brain is in determining our vision. Who's to say it doesn't personalise our perception of colour as well? The fact is that the neural pathways which amplify or dull certain individual colours just aren't understood well enough. In other words, you don't know the answer. Again, I'm getting real sick of your shit culture. Doesn't really matter anyway. I mean, even if we see different colours, we still apply the same laws to colours based on the words we assign them. For example, that orange and blue are complementary colours is an objective fact due to their relationship on the colour wheel. So even if my orange and blue were different from your orange and blue, we would both still believe that those two colours were complementary to one another. You could apply this same logic to design philosophy, paint mixing or any other field where colour is important. But what's more important, and what we should endeavour to understand, is the neural network behind the scenes that controls how our eyes receive light and process this information to give us, arguably, our most important and relied upon sense. Crash? Why haven't you interrupted me yet? Finally, some peace and quiet. Thanks for watching everyone, and for our next thought experiment we'll have an entirely new topic. See you then. Follow Culture Crush on social media!